story was endured since the Napoleonic Wars about an English cavalry officer who, according to the tale, said that the purpose of cavalry and warfare was to give tone to what would otherwise be simply a vulgar brawl. The cavalry trooper in the United States Army was always, from the beginning, a magnificent fighter, and the cavalry itself a magnificent service. Surrounding the very word cavalry, there's a, a warm glow of nostalgia, romance, and valor, a sense of proud men fighting in a proud cause with both dash and distinction. It's now many years since the horse cavalry was abolished in our army. Three wars have been fought without it. But the cavalry itself, its concept and its mission, are still a vital part of today's army. Today, the big picture camera sweeps back through history to bring you the story of the cavalry in its long ride to glory. The story of the U.S. Cavalry threads through our nation's history from its opening pages. This is a salute to those valiant mounted warriors. From the beginning, the Cavalry was part of the ragged and untried Continental Army, which secured the dream of independence for the young nation. It was a small force, however, and it did not really come into its own until the southern campaigns toward the end of the war. Then at King's Mountain and Cowpens, and in a series of other mounted battles, small bodies of regular cavalry routed the British and helped turn the tide of the war. From the revolution emerged one of the first of a long line of distinguished cavalrymen, Light Horse Harry Lee of Virginia whose son, Robert E. Lee, would later make his own mark in another chapter of American history. During the War of 1812, American mounted troops twice scored important victories against the British, once in the Battle of the Thames in western Ontario and against their Indian allies on the Tallapoosa River in Alabama. The war with Mexico, which followed the admission of Texas into the Union, was a cavalry war, particularly with the invasion of the Mexican territories of New Mexico and California, which extended the nation's boundaries to the coastline of the Pacific. The mounted warriors in this conflict fought with a magnificence which prompted their commander to tell them, you have been baptized in fire and blood and have come out steel. The growing nation now stretched across the western prairies. Settlement of the land was violently resisted by the hostile Indians, who made war on the pioneers carrying civilization to the buffalo lands. It now became the task of the hard riding and hard fighting cavalry to make the westward creeping frontiers secure. More than 12,000 miles of territory had to be protected against tribes prepared to fight to the death the migration of white men into their world. The firing of Fort Sumter, heralding the civil war which presented the nation with its greatest test, interrupted the cavalry's mission in the West. Confederate leaders like Jeb Stuart, who twice led his cavalry of the Army of Northern Virginia completely around the opposing Union armies, used mounted troops wisely and colorfully and with spectacular success from the beginning. As a result, the Confederacy had a mounted superiority over the North in the early part of the war. The Union, however, had cavalry giants of its own. Bill Sheridan and James H. Wilson. Under them, the Union Cavalry became one of the greatest forces in the history of warfare. When it broke into action after almost two years on the defensive, 
it literally tore the heart out of the southern forces. The cavalry of both armies, Union and Confederacy, fought with daring and distinction, and with imagination. Together they developed a new concept of cavalry warfare, which took fullest advantage of the cavalry's potential for speed and mobility, completely revolutionizing strategy and tactics which had always before characterized mounted action. With the end of the Civil War, the cavalry trooper turned his attentions once more to the enemy in the West. While the divided nation had been struggling for survival for four years, the Indian tribes, taking advantage of the conflict, had loosed a fury of attacks against the settlements in the West. There followed almost three decades of terror and bloodshed on the plains. Many heroic names from cavalry lore emerged from this period, but none more enduring than that of Major General George Armstrong Custer. His defeat at the hands of a horde of screaming Sioux and Cheyenne braves near the Little Bighorn River has symbolized to generations of Americans the cruel character of the Indian Wars in the West. This sun-baked bridge in southern Montana on a scorching June afternoon in 1876, where every member of Custer's proud and spirited 7th Cavalry Regiment faced and met violent death, the Indian achieved his most memorable victory over the white man. Skirmish followed skirmish in those lusty and troubled years. The whole savage West was aflame. came hard and slowly, and only with the constant pressure of force applied by the mounted guardians of the nation's territories. By the turn of the century, the bloody work of the trooper and his steed was over in the West. America's frontiers were secure at last. For the first time in half a century, peace pervaded the plains and the mountains. And life for the tough cavalrymen became almost routine after the capitulation of the long warring red men. Chief Joseph, the indomitable chief of the Ne Perse who had fought the army bitterly, spelled out the tragic destiny of all the Indian nations with his words of surrender to the cavalry in northern Montana. I am tired of fighting. Our chiefs are killed. It is cold and we have no blankets. The little children are freezing to death. My people have run away to the hills. Hear me, my chiefs. My heart is sick and sad. From where the sun now stands, I will fight no more forever. The next great chapter in cavalry lore bears the indelible imprint of one man, Theodore Roosevelt whose 1st United States Volunteer Cavalry, or Rough Riders as they were called, captured the public's imagination and romantic attention with their courageous charge up San Juan Hill in the Spanish-American War. What was to be the last campaign of the old cavalry came in 1916, with the punitive expedition across the border into Mexico to pursue the bandit Pancho Villa, who had wreaked destruction on American lives and property near the border. No one could know, for history does not reveal itself as it is happening, that the proud formations which gathered here for the long, daring ride into the teeth of the danger that lay waiting would be making the United States Cavalry's last great mounted ride in combat. That here, on this desert stage, the mounted traditions which stretched back to the winning of the Republic would be played out in a final pageant. But although none could know it, least of all the troopers themselves. They rode and they fought 
as if they realized they were waging this last historic battle for history's record. beginning of World War I, the history of the cavalry changed forever. A regiment of cavalry troopers and horses landed in France with the American Expeditionary Force. Western Front was stabilized into a trench warfare of massed fire and little change of position, and there was no use for the mobility of cavalry. At training camps back in the States, there was still no reason to believe that the end of the cavalry was in sight, however. Even though the greatest war in human history had left it behind, this was because of factors beyond the control of strategists. Cavalry was still very much an active force, and mounted troops trained constantly to keep in readiness for the day when the combat situation might change. So the training went on unceasingly, training in all the qualities which have made cavalry indispensable. Maneuverability, movement, horsemanship. Only once in Europe during World War I, however, was American cavalry employed tactically. For the most part, Instead of fighting with the esprit and dash which had distinguished it in so many other wars, the cavalry in Europe was left with the unfamiliar task of running various remount stations. Mules and horses used for transport were cared for at these depots. Horse himself, proud steed bred to the thrill of excitement, became for a while a messenger, a carrier of supplies, for whom the bugle call to battle no longer sounded. He was treated well and with consideration, however, as befits an honored warrior who had been withdrawn for a while from the battle. Still, there was no valid reason to believe the story of the cavalry was ending. Despite the small part it had played, all the great generals of the war paid tribute to its continuing function. General John Pershing declared, There is not in the world today an officer of distinction who does not believe with emphasis that cavalry is as important today as it ever has been. So, with the end of World War I, the pride and the polish of the cavalry remained undiminished. Colorful and aggressive, it continued to train devotedly in its traditional role of the army's mobile arm, the antennae of a striking force.